Okay, so Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching to his disciples and a bunch of people start showing up on the side of a mountain, a mountain uh, to watch and listen and, and learn from, from Jesus. And in this sermon, he's talking about murder and people are like, yeah, I'm totally with you on that one. And then he says, don't commit adultery. People are like, yep, on the same page. And then he says, hey, if you get slapped in the face, let them slap you again on the other side of your face. And some people are kind of like, I don't know that I'm on the same page with you on that one, Jesus. But over the course of this, uh, this sermon, he goes on to want to talk about judging others. And he says this, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. The same measure you use against them will be measured on you. And at this point in the sermon, uh, Jesus is probably starting to notice maybe some eyes starting to glaze over, some short attention spans. If maybe we had some smartphones, we might be 30 or 40 scrolls in a TikTok by this point, okay? But as he notices that, he decides he's gonna tell a story to grab people's attention and to help put a sharper point on this, uh, this topic of judging others. And he tells this story. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you help your brother to take out the speck of sawdust from his eye all the while you have a plank in your own eye? First, remove the plank from your eye. And then, after you don't have a two by four sticking out of your eyeball, then you can see clearly to help remove the speck from your brother's eye. Well, everybody, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church this weekend. I am delighted that you are here, whether you're at one of our physical locations spread all across the beautiful state of Iowa uh, or online campus all across Iowa and beyond. We are one church on many corners. We're really, really glad that you're here today. And I want to start today by celebrating something really, really cool. So across all of our campuses last weekend, we baptized 16 people. Amen. Yeah, it's good stuff. And uh, hey, uh, awesome to see pictures of Jesus' story in the lives of his people when they get baptized. Really, really cool. And so you may not know any of those people that got baptized, but you're a part of their story because you're a part of Prairie Lakes Church. So thanks for giving. Thanks for inviting. Thanks for serving. It's making a huge impact all across Iowa and beyond. So well done there. And uh, ready or not, guys, it's Super Bowl weekend. So Here's my, uh, my baseline thing before we begin. Uh, how many of you, like Pastor John, are giant Chiefs fans and you're pulling for the Chiefs today? How many of you, Chiefs fans? Uh, how many of you are pulling for the Philadelphia Eagles? How many of you don't care, you just want good food and funny commercials? <laughs> There's a lot of people in that boat, I know. So I should cheer for Kansas City because I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is really close to Kansas City, but there are three former Huskers playing for the Philadelphia Eagles. So even though I don't like Phillies fans, I got to cheer for Philadelphia because of the Husker connection as a Husker fan. I got to do it. So love me or hate me, I'm cheering for the Eagles today. Uh, all right, friends, let's dive in uh, together. This is week two of a five-week series called The Stories Jesus Told. And we're looking at five different parables or teachings of Jesus. And each one of them is really beautiful in its simplicity and meaning. And Jesus in each one of them tells a very profound truth in a very practical way. And during the series, we've encouraged you to jump into a small group and uh, be a part of a small group. I know many of you have and are, and that's awesome. And if you aren't yet, I just want to remind you, uh, you can dive in. Uh, right now, you can grab your phone, you can text groups to 99581, uh, and you can jump into a group right now in this moment. So I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, if you haven't done that yet, you get an opportunity to do that. But hey, whether you're in a group or not, here's what I want to just remind you of. Uh, we've got a sermon study guide that we produce every single week. It's on our website that you can download and check out. And it really does help you dive deeper into the content we talk about on the weekends during the week. And my small group grabbed the one last weekend and dove in and it was really, really good. So I want to encourage you to take advantage of that sermon study guide. All right, now let's dive into some content here. We're going to talk about the parable of the speck and the plank from Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 5 that you just heard wonderfully narrated. Now, uh, the teaching of Jesus in this parable is 
by far the most quoted verse, that first verse, do not judge lest you be judged by non-Christians. It is a huge cultural value in our world today, more than John 3.16, more than love your neighbor, more than Psalm 23, do not judge is the most quoted Bible verse by non-Christians. And I also want to just say that these verses we're going to read today are also some of the most frequently broken commands of Jesus by Christians. We struggle with these verses, and we struggle to know how to apply them correctly. And so the questions we're going to answer this weekend is, why is that? And what do we do about these words of Jesus? How do we respond to these words of Jesus? Now, before we dive in, some simple context, okay? I want to just get you the lay of the land of this passage. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, is talking to his disciples, and a crowd is gathered around him. And uh, it's part of the greatest sermon ever told in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And in this, this chapter and in this passage we're going to read together this weekend, specifically, Jesus is targeting a group of people known as the Pharisees. He's taking a few shots at them because these religious zealots, Jewish zealots called Pharisees, uh, were self-righteous. And they were often very hypocritical. Uh, they often contradict the way of life of Jesus. They're self-righteous, they're hypocritical, they claim to follow, follow God, but they're persecuting Jesus. In fact, they're some of the people that most loudly push for the crucifixion of Jesus. And these Pharisees, they held people to crazy high religious standards, moral standards, but their hearts were not turned to God in worship. And at one point, Jesus even calls them whitewashed tombs, meaning they look really good on the outside, but internally they're full of death and decay. They are hypocrites. So that's the backdrop of the words we're about to read in Matthew chapter 7. So let's dive into this passage together. Here's how Jesus starts in verse 1. He says this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Black and white. Simple, there it is, do not judge or you too will be judged. The favorite verse of non-Christians in our world. Well, you can't tell me what's right or wrong. Uh, you can't tell me that I can't or shouldn't blank. I mean, who are you to judge my gender or my sexuality? And like a kid yelling, you aren't the boss of me. Our culture loves this verse. And individuals inside and outside of the church throughout church history have struggled to apply this verse. And so here's what we've got to be clear on as we begin today. What is this verse actually saying? And what is this verse not saying? Like, for instance, is it okay to judge somebody's bad haircut? I mean, can you tell them they're having a bad hair day or a bad hair month? Or in my case, I never have a good hair day <laughs> anymore. Is that okay, right? So like, what does judging mean? So like the word judge in English, the Greek word that Jesus uses here uh, can have several different meanings. Uh, not, it's not a word of the singular meaning. And so the Greek word that Jesus uses in this verse is the Greek word krino. A and the two main meanings of the word krino could be to discern right from wrong or to condemn. It's to discern or condemn. And so we have to ask the question, which meaning is Jesus applying when he says, don't judge or you will be judged? Well, is he talking about discerning right from wrong or condemning others? The sinful judgment that Jesus is talking about here is when we condemn others. He's not talking about discerning right from wrong. And, and the question is, well, then how do we know that that's true? How do we know that? Well, the context of the passage, but also the context of the Bible as a whole. Because the Bible is full of exhortations for followers of Jesus to discern right from wrong, to judge what is good from what is bad. We are told repeatedly in the Bible what sin is and what honoring God is. And we're told to avoid sin and honor God, to choose that. We're called to judge good fruit from bad fruit. We're called as Christians to call sin, sin. And we do. We repent and we confess when we sin. And all that is good. All that is discerning. But Jesus is talking about condemning in Matthew chapter 7. In fact, later on in chapter 7, Jesus talks about discerning between uh, true and false prophets, true and false disciples, and wise and foolish builders. So Jesus, when he says, don't judge, isn't talking about discerning. He's talking about condemning others. In fact, here's how I would summarize what Jesus is saying in verse 1. The sinful judgment is condemning others. It's actually when we devalue others. It's when we push others down in our hearts and minds in order to lift others up. When Jesus says, don't judge or you will be judged, he's essentially saying this, don't condemn or you will be 
condemn. Don't devalue others. Don't, don't push others down just to lift yourself up. That's what Jesus is warning about in verse 1. Now, I've shared this example before, but I am a judgmental driver. When I sin the most, it's when I'm behind the wheel of a car, okay? I am a pharisaical driver. <laughs> when people are driving around me, and I get these 10 second little snippets or interactions of people, I can judge people very quickly based on how they are driving and whether they're a perfect driver just like me. And I say not nice things about people in my car when I'm driving. And when I say not nice things, I don't mean like, hey buddy, you're a bad driver. I mean things I can't say right now in the middle of a message at church. And it's embarrassing and it's not good, but I am so quick to judge people based on how they drive. And it's not okay and it's not good. But maybe for you, you find your source of judgment of others in your life based on uh, political affiliation or party. And maybe for you, you're really quick to judge people on the other side of the political aisle. And we can so easily push people down who don't align with us or agree with us politically. Or maybe for you, it's easy for you to judge people of a different skin color, a different physical appearance, uh, a different kind of neighborhood than you live in, different kind of clothes they might wear, even the, the team they represent on their jersey. We can often make incredible leaps about people into judgment and devalue other people based, based on how we see them or the things that they represent. In fact, there's a, there's a pattern that we often fall into when it comes to sinfully judging the people around us. And I've seen this pattern at work over and over again where we push people down and elevate ourselves. And here's how the pathway towards judgment often works in our lives. It goes from observation to assumption to judgment and then to marginalization. So observation, we observe a behavior about someone and whether it be a 10 second snippet or a bunch of different snippets, but we see someone behaving a certain way saying a certain thing or looking a certain way, and we start to make assumptions about that person based on that snippet. And to be fair, sometimes those observations are correct, but many times they're wrong. And it's not sinful to make observations. It's not sinful to make assumptions. In fact, people make it all the time about me. And I think a lot of times we've been in spots where we've had assumptions made about us that are not true, and we usually don't like that. And I get this every time I tell people what I do for a living that I'm a pastor. They're kind of like, oh... And I can tell they're making assumptions. And this is not sinful. Okay, we do this all the time. But the problem is when we let our observations and our assumptions turn to sinful judgment, it's sinful and wrong and bad. When we start to judge a person, devalue a person, press them down to elevate ourselves based on these two things, that's what Jesus is saying don't do. And if we continue in sinful judgment, it leads to marginalization of people in our lives. And here's what I mean by that. If our assumptions lead to sinful judgment, we push others down. If we continue in that judgment and we don't repent of that and we don't confess that to God or turn around, it leads to marginalization and hatred. And here's what I mean by that. If I can justify sinfully judging someone and pushing them down, devaluing them, it's not long before I can justify doing or saying virtually anything to that coworker, that political group, that religious group, or that neighbor in my little Iowa because blank, whatever that is. It is a predictable pattern that we often walk down. And Jesus invites us as his followers to break that pathway. That when we make observations and then assumptions to not let that go into sinful judgment. And we're going to talk about how to do that in just a few minutes. But I love this quote by Greg Boyd. Greg Boyd is a pastor in the Twin Cities and he gave a message about 17 or 18 years ago, and he said this, and I love this quote. He said, you cannot love and judge, meaning condemn, at the same time. It's impossible to ascribe unsurpassable worth to others when you're using others to ascribe worth to yourself. When we let our, our observations and assumptions turn into sinful judgment, it's impossible to love that person while at the same time pressing them down and devaluing them for whatever reason we've put up in our minds and hearts that we should be doing that. It is impossible to love and judge at the same time. I think it's important for us to just remember that. And some of you right now are in a spot where you're like feeling a little bit convicted. And I think that's a really, really good thing. And that's why Jesus says these words. But, but Jesus takes it another step. And look what he says in, in verse 2 of Matthew 7. He says, For... In the same way you judge others, you condemn others, 
you will be condemned. You will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He says, hey, when you press people down, it comes back on you. It swings back on you. And I love the honesty of Jesus because this plays out in all of our lives. So here's a risky exercise I want to invite you to participate in right now. Here's what I want you to do. And I'm not kidding. I want you to think about the most judgmental person you know right now. Don't point, okay? But, but just think about them right now in your life. Think about the person who always makes himself superior to others, who's always talking down about people or speaking badly about others, who's always trying to lift themselves up by stepping on people around them. Think about the ways they've hurt you, maybe even the ways that they've caused disdain for the name of Christ because they say they're a Christian, but they, they condemn people all the time. Now, you got that person? How many of you just thought of yourself? <laughs> like nobody, right? None of you thought of yourself. None of us do. But I want you to think about that person in your life right now. And here's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine that person just got in trouble. Like they blew it at school, at work, maybe legally. They got found out. They got caught. They're in it deep. Okay, they're in trouble. That person who's so judgmental is being judged. <laughs> How do you feel about that? You feel good? You feel satisfied? If you're like me, you start to smile a little bit and you're like, yes, throw the book at them. No justice for them. They're nailed. Get them. Finally, it's about stinking time. And why do we feel that way? <laughs> because that stinking hypocrite was judging everybody around them. They mistreated and marginalized all kinds of people. And now it's swinging back on them. And this principle is so true that those that devalue others and judge others by putting them down, they are the, the people that are often judged the harshest by others in their lives. Why? Because they've earned it. <laughs> Judgmental people quickly run out of fans and friends, and in their time of need, they often find little mercy and grace because they failed to extend it to others. If you are a judgmental person that is pushing others down and enjoys that, you will quickly find judgment pressing down on you without mercy. That is the message Jesus wants to communicate. And then Jesus, he takes it even a step further. And he uses this really cool image in verses 3, 4, and 5. He says this, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that's in your own eye? And how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. That is a strong word. First, take the plank out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, what I want you to notice about this passage is this. Jesus doesn't say that it's wrong to see the speck in your brother or sister's eye. He's not saying it's wrong to see sin. He's not even saying it's wrong to confront sin or call sin out. We are supposed to do those things. What Jesus is saying is it's all about our approach. It's all about our heart behind confrontation or seeing sin in someone else. It's about whether or not we're doing it in love or judgment. See, what Jesus was so opposed to the Pharisees about and what Jesus is so opposed in our lives about is not the strength of our belief, but the hypocritical nature of our hearts. The type of judgment or correcting that Jesus is opposed to is self-righteous, hypocritical judgment which is correcting that is done in a self-seeking way and not love. So I've got my beautiful two by four here, <laughs> my, my plank. And uh, self, this represents self-righteousness. And self-righteousness believes that we are good because of what we've done. In, in fact, it believes that we're superior because of some moral or behavioral standard that we hit that the people around us don't. And so we push people down. We view people as less than because I'm self-righteous. I'm better, I'm good because of X, Y, and Z. But the problem with self-righteousness is that it leads to blindness. When we elevate ourselves and we push others around us down, we become blind. We sinfully judge others and ignore our own sinfulness and brokenness, and we become blind. And by the way, it looks pretty ridiculous to have a two-by-four attached to your eye. But the problem is, a lot of us, as followers of Jesus, we walk around looking like this, and we're not aware that we're looking like this because we are blind by our self-righteousness. Let me give you an example. We're at work, and all of a sudden we say, oh, good grief. I, 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 
she, she's gossiping about her coworkers again. And I can't believe it. There's a speck in her eye, and I need to take that speck out of her eye. All the while, you got a two by four in your eye, because while you're focused on her gossiping, you're cheating at work, and you're cutting corners. <laughs> There's a plank in your eye. You're not aware of it, and it's hypocritical, and it's self-righteous for you to say, hey, let me take care of that little tiny piece of sawdust, because you got a plank in your own eye. Or maybe you're in a spot where you're struggling because you're angry and you're ticked off and there's a plank in your eye because, because your accountability partner confessed to you that this last weekend they looked at pornography. And you're ticked off and you're frustrated with them and you're like, why can't they just stop? It's the third time in the last two months he's confessed this sin to me and you're so fired up and you're so mad you just want to remove that little speck from his eye and all the while you are texting inappropriately a woman that is not your wife. And you're walking around looking like this, hypocritical, self-righteous, devaluing and judging others, all the while you got a giant two by four in your eye. This is what Jesus is telling us not to do. <laughs> not to do. This is what the Pharisees walked around and did. They had a giant plank in their eyes and they tried to tell everybody around them that they're superior, all the while there is deep sin in their own lives. And my friends, this crazy image is what the watching world often sees when they see Christians. They see us running around, sinfully judging all the people around us, holding them to our standards all the while they go, but what about you? And what about that thing in your life? See, self-righteous judgment and confrontation is always about proving how good you are. And, and really, self-righteous judgment and confrontation is always about how you're not loving or helping the people around you. It's about pushing others down. It's hypocritical. And Jesus wanted to remind the disciples 2,000 years ago, and he wants to remind you today that you are no better off than the person that you're confronting, that you're no better off, that you need as much mercy and grace as they do, and that you've got stuff in your eyes too. In fact, it's often the people that pretend not to need grace and forgiveness or repentance that often need it the most. But love confronts differently. L love seeks to restore gently and correct gently. It seeks to build up people and elevate others, to pull people up. It empathizes with others. It refuses to make superficial judgments about people based on little snippets or to hypocritically pretend to be better than others. And I want to let you in on a little secret that I've learned uh, from being a pastor for about 20 years. <laughs> and here's the secret. Often the people who are the loudest, who get on their soapbox the most, who condemn and judge others the most, those are the people that have the most to hide. <laughs> They're the ones that have the most to hide. The people that I talk to that grumble, they come to Prairie Lakes Church and they're like, oh, you know, all, all the church cares about is my money. All, all God cares about is my money. Or I don't like the way Prairie Lakes Church handles finances. Those are often the people that don't give or give the least. They're not generous in their lives. When I hear somebody as a pastor start to get really, really loud about politics or a social issue, whether it's in person or on social media, it's like an alarm bell going off for me because often what I come to find out months or years later is there was a lot lurking behind that for them, that they had a plank in their eye. And rather than look at that, they wanted to project it on everybody else around them. So the question is this, hey, how do we avoid sinful judgment and devaluing of others? I mean, how do we make sure that we don't confront others hypocritically? How do we make sure that we confront in love, that we love the people around us, and that we don't go from observation to assumption to judgment? How do we, how do we prevent that? Well, I'm going to give you three principles uh, to help you avoid sinful, self-righteous judgment of others. And these principles are really, really important. And so I want you to grab a hold of them. So, so how do we make sure that we love and not condemn. Here's the first principle that I want you to grab a hold of. It's this, work hard at developing self-awareness to kill your self-righteousness. Work hard at developing self-awareness to kill your self-righteousness. Another way to say this is pull the plank out of your eye regularly. <laughs> Learn how to pull the plank out of your eye so that you can see clearly. Consistently examine your own heart and your own life. Confess your sin to God and others regularly. 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote these words to Timothy, a young pastor, and he said this in 1 Timothy 4. He said, watch your life and your doctrine closely. In other words, watch how you live and what you believe. Why? 
persevere in them because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. The message is be aware of how you're living. Be aware of what you're believing and what you're doing. Watch those things closely. And here's what I mean when I say become self-aware. I don't mean live by your life and your standards. Here's what I mean. As a follower of Jesus, examine your heart, examine your life by the standards of Scripture, by the Holy Spirit's help. I want to invite you to invite God to dig into your thoughts, your heart, your motives regularly. Ask God to help you see your two by fours and your blind spots and then pull them out, which requires you to listen to other believers, your small group members, your spouse, your friends. They need to be able to say true things to you and about you. Regularly see your sin because it helps you better empathize with the people around you And it helps prevent you from wrongly and sinfully judging the people around you. Being aware of your sin and your need for grace and forgiveness helps you see and empathize with compassion rather than judgment. And one of the ways I do this personally is at night, I I do a prayer of exam in most nights. And I just let God scan my heart and my life. I let him evaluate my day. And I ask God two questions. And here's the two questions. Number one, God, where did I sense your presence and nearness today? And where did I honor you? So it starts positive. The second question is this, God, where did I sense your absence or attempt to live for myself and not for you? And it's in those moments where I recognize my absence from God's uh, presence or obedience or where I just, I recognize, hey, th- there's this thing I need to repent of. And a lot of times it's my driving, <laughs> but, but it's a lot of different things. And sometimes I smile when I evaluate my day. And most nights I need to confess and repent certain things. It keeps me mindful of my sin. It helps me pull the two by four out of my eye. It reminds me of my need for grace and it prevents me from sinfully condemning and judging and pushing people down around me. Principle number one that you gotta start with is working hard at developing self-awareness to kill your self-righteousness. That's principle one. Here's principle number two to avoid sinful judging. Don't expect non-Christians to live up to Christian standards. I cannot say this strongly enough. Do not expect non-Christians to live up to Christian standards. 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote these beautiful words and these freeing words to the churches around Corinth that, that, by the way, Corinth was really, really messed up like our world today. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 5. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside the church? See, listen, I talk to Christians all the time who are Outrage, not just concerned, but they are outraged by the state of our country, the state of our world, the state of our nation. I cannot believe the decline, the decay, the moral corruption, the level of sin, the depravity. And I listen to that and I'm like, really? Like, you can't believe that? You, you, you can't believe that the people that don't claim to follow Jesus don't live like Jesus, right? Because the Bible calls us sojourners and foreigners and aliens and not of this world, yet we always expect this world to act like us or to act like Jesus, even when we don't. And here's a reality I need you to remember. I can't hold, I can't hold your family accountable to my family rules. So in my house, my home, we've got family rules. And we know them, we abide by them, we follow them. But how ridiculous would it be for me to cross the street to my neighbor And not only say, hey, these are your family rules, but I need you to live by my family rules. It'd be ridiculous, right, if I did it. Yet we do this all the time. And by the way, this reality of how we often judge those in our little Iowa is why so many Christians, or so many non-Christians rather, step away from the church. Because they see us as the church trying to hold the world to standards that they don't understand or agree to live by. And oftentimes we aren't living by and we're judging those around us by a standard that they don't even know. By our family values and our house rules. And they say, I don't know about that. Listen, I am not called to change the people outside the family of God. That's God's job. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus changes people by the power of the Holy Spirit, not me and not you. And it is not our job to judge people outside the family of God by the standards of the family of God. And my friends, all people are created in the image of God. All people, whether they follow Jesus or not, are image bearers of God. And we, when we judge those outside the family of God by our family rules, we walk around with giant planks in our eyes and we look and act in ways that push people away from the family of God. 
And my friends, this is why we're a no matter church. No, no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done or what's been done to you before, God loves you and you can look for God at Prairie Lakes Church. You can belong before you believe. We, as God's people at Prairie Lakes, we need to constantly live up to that standard. To not judge sinfully when someone walks through our doors who isn't there yet. We, and we don't hold people in our seats to standards that we follow if they're not there yet. We are a no matter church. And so my encouragement, friends, is this. Stop sinfully judging those outside the family of God by our family values and standards. It frees you in a lot of really incredible ways. That's principle number two. Don't hold non-Christians to Christian standards. Here's the third principle that I want you to learn and follow and practice. It's this. Restore fallen believers gently. Within the family of God, <laughs> this is one of our rules. We restore people in our family gently. If someone in the church is caught in sin, if they're trapped by sin, if they're found out, we restore them and communicate with them gently. And this is true whether it's a small group member, a fellow volunteer, a friend, an accountability partner, a neighbor. Uh, we restore people within the family of God gently. We don't judge hypocritically. We don't drop the hammer on them. We restore them gently. And the answer, the question is like, well, why? Well, the Bible tells us so. Here's what Galatians 6, 1 says. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. Watch yourselves. We restore people gently, but we're also careful because we know that we might have planks in our own eyes. And Paul wrote these words to the churches around Galatia because he knows the importance of restoring people gently. He knows the temptation to be judgmental and devalue those you're restoring. And he knows that it's easy to keep the plank in your own eye. And he knows that he needs grace and that he's not immune to stumbling. And, and let's be honest, friends, someday, someday you will be the one that needs to be restored. So treat them the way you'd want to be treated when you fall, struggle, and sin. Now, Within the family of God, within the church, we call sin, sin. But we don't kick our brothers and sisters when they're down. We don't shoot our wounded. We love them. We value them. And I've seen this done really well, and I've seen this done poorly. I've seen couples that are going through all kinds of marital stuff put all of their marital dirty laundry on social media, and that is not a loving, gentle way to manage that. But I've also been a part of a lot of different conversations at Prairie Lakes with staffers, members, uh, volunteer leaders, where we've had to restore them, where there's been a significant sin, we've had to walk through a process of reconciliation. And I just got to tell you, when it's done in love, without sinful judgment, when it's done in love and it's done gently, it is a beautiful thing to see somebody walk that line back to restoration. It's a beautiful thing. But we restore one another within the church. We restore fallen believers gently. Okay, That's who we are. It's a part of our house family rules. So those are the three principles that I want to encourage you to live by because when you do, it takes the plank out of your eye and allows you to see clearly so that you can love the people around you, remember that you need grace and love and not sinfully judge. Hey, as we conclude, I, I want to just let you know in just a moment, we're going to go to a time of communion. And really it is a time to evaluate your heart and your life. Before we do, I want to just give you one more verse that I think is really, really helpful with this issue of judgment. And it's, uh, it's 1 John, or it's John, rather, 1.14. And it says this, The Word, meaning Jesus Christ, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And we've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. He wasn't either or. And we need to constantly balance grace and truth. And part of loving people and not sinfully judging them is balancing grace and truth. And truth, if we're all grace and no truth, that leads to license, right? Anything goes. And that's not what we've called to be as Christians. That's not who we're called to be. If we're all truth and no grace, it leads to rebellion and self-righteousness and judgment. And that's not what we've been called to as Christians either. It is grace and truth. And my friends, there's a reason why grace is listed first. <laughs> because without grace, truth cannot be heard. Jesus in, in Matthew 7 is warning us, hey, lead with grace. Don't always lead with truth. Watch how you confront others. Love others. Don't push them down. Lift people up. Encourage people. Don't sinfully judge. And when you need to correct, do it gently and in love. In just a moment, we're going to be able to reflect on 
how well we're doing in this area with communion. Before we do that, though, let's pray together right now. Hey, Lord, thank you for these words of yours from 2,000 years ago. God, thank you for your grace and your truth, and thank you that your words often convict us and correct us like the words we just read. As we enter into a time of communion and reflection, God, we ask that you would speak to us, reveal to us where we may be sinfully judging others, and God, point out any self-righteous beliefs or self-righteous attitudes that we have. Help us to repent and to confess anything we need to, and God, remind us of our need for grace and forgiveness in this moment. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we all pray together. Amen.